Um, welcome everybody to the uh, probabilistic machine learning reading group. Um, tonight we're starting on the fourth section of the book, and we'll be looking at non parametric non parametric models. Um, tonight's presenter is Morgan Hugh. Sir Pierre, are you talking? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Uh, um, can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. Um, just give me one second, sorry. Uh, no problem, take your time. I can see your screen just fine, by the way. Try once again. Nothing. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? I, I can't hear you, Pierre. Sorry. Um, Are you okay. Um, so I, I'm not going to, I don't want to hold this up anymore. So if it's okay. Uh, Pierre, can I just get started? Um, um, and if you could just put comments in the chat. Absolutely. For now, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, thank you so much. Um, so um, 905 for 905 Pierre. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd love to get started. So I'm um, sorry I haven't been here the, the last couple of weeks. I know I've missed a, a Pretty some pretty key chapters, but this uh, this week um, we're kind of switching gears to um, non-parametric models. So um, uh, this is uh, this is what they're going to call exemplar-based models, and um, so sometimes also called instance-based learning. Um, and we're going to go over um, K nearest neighbor classification. And then um, learning learning the the metric uh, um, and typically learning an embedding um, in sixteen point two, and then in sixteen point three we'll cover kernel density estimation. So um, uh, yeah, so getting getting into um, sixteen oh one here. Uh, so, like I said, there these are these are models. Uh, unlike the parametric models, either conditional or unconditional. Um, in this case, the training data is actually kept, and so uh, when we cover all these particular um, the particular techniques in the chapter, you'll see that uh, these are a lot of the kind of like the simple cases. Um, but these are actually very, they're very memory intensive and they're very computationally intensive. And so a lot of the kind of um, uh, nuances or, or uh, sophisticated um, work that goes on in these particular methods is really focused on, it, it seems to be focused on improving the kind of computational efficiency and the, the memory efficiency, since typically uh, uh, or at least in the, the simplest cases, these are keeping all the training data. So, uh, so 16.1, um, so we see the, the simplest classifier known as the K nearest neighbor classifier. And the idea is to classify a new input X uh, to, to look at the K closest examples to X in the training set, so denoted. NKXD. 
and then look at their labels and derive a distribution over the outputs for that for that region around the X, right? So here in 16.1 <clears throat> uh, is the typical example. Um, so P Y equals C, the class, and uh, and uh, uh, right. So so given uh, X and and D, so one over K, <clears throat> and then this is the the sum over the 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 YN labels. And we can return this distribution or the or the majority label, right? So the two main parameters in this model are the, the size of the neighborhood, K, and the, the distance metric, right? So the what what's the the D X X prime that you're going to use? And certainly the most common is this Malhel Nobis distance. So DM X uh, mu uh, equals you know square root of uh, the kind of the mean center transpose the mean center um, data m times the mean center uh, where m is a positive definite matrix right and so a lot of this comes out of you know, positive definite definite matrix theory um, and and obviously if this is the identity that this reduces to the Euclidean distance right. <clears throat> so and again these are these are um, very simple. <clears throat> and uh, as he covers here, these, these are, are remarkably effective. It's a remarkably effective classifier. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that it's still, you know, not, not really an optimal uh, uh, technique. But uh, then just covering here in 1601, I mean, say 16.1, figure 16.1, you can see this example where, you know, given a, a, a K equals five um, classifier that our X has, you know, the, the, the five closest points would return this tuple of, you know, one, 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 zero, zero. And that gives us, uh, um, you know, if if we're asking, um, so we see there in 16.1.1, you know, if we're asking uh, P equal, you know, Y equals one for X, D, then, then that would be three fifths, right? Or 0. 0.6. And um, the second example they're giving is, is more the, um, I don't know if you would call this a, like a partitioning, um, but, uh, but this is the Verona uh, tessellation, uh, you know, where the K equals one. So this is the, the B figure. Right, so this, I, I wasn't quite sure about this, this partition space, but I think that's, that's how the, the tessellation is different. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so the, the, the region around each of those, those data points includes, um, uh, well, that's that's how the the part the the I think you'd say the input space is partitioned, um, and uh, within each cell, the predicted label is the label of the corresponding tra training point. So this is this that's just a simple example. Um, uh, Sixteen point two has a you know a bit more of a, uh, a real world example, and and you can see. As K is is um, increased, um, you see the kind of you know the the, the smoothing, if you will, of the the boundary uh, partition lines um, but between the classes. And you know, so in uh, 16.2, um there's the talk of the cursed dimensionality and, and this figure 16.3 is, is trying to get across that. Um, uh, I, think, I think B is obviously the, the, um, uh, the, the figure of note here where, you know, the, the fraction of data in the neighborhood, the, uh, the D equals one line is giving us um, the, the one dimension where, you know, if you want 10% of the, the data points here, 
um, you know, the fraction of the data in the neighborhoods, and then the, um, what do they call it, edge length? You know, so this is this matches, right? So if you want 10% of the data, you need, you know, 0.1 of the, the length of the box um, uh, in the, the 1D example. But how quickly this, this uh, jumps up um, uh, uh, in terms of increasing the dimensionality. So at D equals three, um, that, that point one is, you know, at, what's that, like four, 4.5. Um, and this is getting across the idea that, you know, um, high dimensional space is a, is a lonely place, I think is, uh, is there's some, there's some great quote I was reading. Um, uh, so, so two, two main things that, that one, the, um, the data points are starting to get um, very far apart, but also that the, um, the, the, the average distance to another point is starting to get uh, as close to the, to the, um, to the nearest point and um, as the dimensionality increases, and that also is giving you kind of like less information with, with each of those. Um, so this is, this is the curse of dimensionality that is um, spoken of uh, quite a bit, especially with these techniques. Um, and they go into some detail about how the, you know, KNN in particular, nearest neighbor in particular, suffers from this. <clears throat> And um, right, so yeah, so at e e ten, you know, um, so yeah, point one is point eight. So yeah, we need to extend it eighty percent at just at ten dimensions. And I think this is why they were saying that, like, so so quickly after um, ten or ten dimensions that uh, it becomes impossible. Uh, uh, approximate methods are necessary. Um, and that's what they're going to cover here in 16.1.3 is the, um, at least, you know, if you look at scikit-learn documentation, um, you know, the kinds of um, uh, uh, partitioning methods, the, the kitty tree and um, the ball tree, <clears throat> which I, th I think is actually an improvement of um, on top of the KD tree um, are the, the typical techniques that are actually implemented in, in um, scikit-learn uh, to, to cover, uh, I mean, you know, that, that is how it, it is efficiently done <laughs> um, uh, or more efficiently done. I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't drop in too much into the, the the, the hashing techniques that um, that were available, but um, but I did check out this uh, face um, Facebook library face <laughs> F A A I S S, and you know again you know past um, scikit learn there's some uh, some speed improvements in this C plus plus library for doing you know K means clustering and and um, yeah, near to neighbor search and things. And then um, finishing up this particular section, um, just really quick, uh, they, they don't get into it too much, but it's really just talking about the fact that, you know, what we've been, we've been considering is, is um, you know, where K is essentially fixed or you know, C is fixed. And this is what we, they would call closed world assumption. Obviously, you know, the real world is a, a complicated place and what you really want is, um, you know, open set recognition or being able to not only do the kinds of clustering and, and nearest neighbor searches and things to get at similarity, but also to uh, open up the possibility that you might be presented either with uh, what they're calling, you know, novelty detection. So the, the ability to detect a, a new class. Um, uh, the continual learning is to, you know, actually bring that class 
in and so that like as you continue on you would uh have you know a c plus one or you know is like ct plus one <clears throat> classes and um and then i think the out of distribution detection difference there is just um uh if you actually were um, presented not with just a new class, but a new distribution. Um, and, uh, I'm not quite sure the subtlety there. Maybe that's just explaining vocabulary. <clears throat> but then they, they talk about the, certainly this, um, uh, some of the references are bringing up face verification as a, a great example of, of some of these things are certainly where we need to um, have some considerations in these. So, um, right. Well, the key ingredient for all of these is the, the metric. So I'm not sure what that is there. But um, yeah, so I, I didn't get into, you know, th this is, um, I am literally reading along with you. So I haven't got into much of these uh, um, kind of advanced topics, um, but I'm interested to hear more about this. Um, so, okay. Uh, so the next section is the, the learning the distance metrics. So here, um, being able to compute a distance between, you know, two points, X and X prime, <clears throat> or, or their similarity, um, is obviously, you know, what, um, what this is all about, right? However, um, actually computing this um, is, or actually um, kind of learning this uh, from the data is quite, uh, is quite difficult. And, and, you know, like I said, they, talk about the fact that some of these some of the, the techniques that they're actually discussing here are really because approximations are necessary for for making it computationally efficient so um even though i'm i'm not, I'm not going to follow their discussion here quite but certainly the first example uh 16.2.1.1 is giving what i would say is like Kind of like the the here's how we're going to learn the Mahalbanobis distance <laughs> matrix, um, and in this case they're just using a um, uh, this ni is a set of target neighbors, um, and they're optimizing this. Um, well, they're doing two things, right? So they're going to pull similar points together. And, you know, this is the whole, the whole idea of the Mahalobinovis distance or measurement uh, or matrix. And um, so this, this loss pull of M uh, summing over N and JN, JN. Um, so, the, and then this, this squared, squared uh, distance. We want to ensure that the incorrect labels are far away, so they're going to do this this push as well, right? And then the overall objective is this LM one minus lambda L pull uh, M plus lambda L push M, um, where lambda is between zero and one. And uh, apparently, this can be um, minimized using semi-definite programming. But this is the this is the key point and kind of what you'll see for the for the rest of this this particular section is that um, you know when they say alternatively we can parameterize the problem using m uh, w t w um, so finding this this um, you know linear linear weighting or linear mapping and it's you know a low dimensional mapping, right? Um, so they, they um, th this jumps a little bit, right? So it, even though 
the next the next section is talking about neighborhood component analysis. <clears throat> So it does relate to the W, but um, it seems like we're no longer, you know, just thinking about how to, to compute M directly. Um, and uh, again, this is this is brought up. Uh, it's good to see this, in, at least in the scikit-learn um, documentation. This is under the neighborhood section, nearest neighbor section. Um, and uh, the... So um, I'm not great at uh, giving you setting out these, uh, explaining these graphical models um, of these plates, but um, but it, it, the important thing being this linear softmax function that in 16.6 um, that uh, is yeah is is really giving you the um, uh, the details here and um, sorry. yeah so I I, I didn't um, I didn't quite understand the the need to discuss the latent coincidence analysis um, uh, but in this case, again, it's it's like a um, oh sorry, sixteen point four is the coincidence analysis. Okay, and um, uh, I I wondered if it's also if it's just setting us up for the the later sections of the pairwise contrastive loss. Um, uh, wasn't exactly exactly sure um, but well I, I can so for, forgive me for not I'm, I'm gonna be reading <laughs> um, so there is another way to learn the linear mapping W such that M uh, equals you know W transpose W um, and in this case um, yeah they're mapping to no. No, I'm sorry. Um, it's it's probably best if if anybody um, uh, has any comments on it. Um, but I, I'll, I'm going to keep going just because the the deep metric learning is what they're they're going to focus on. Um, so uh, obviously, the the deep metric learning um, the 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 trick here, uh, as I said earlier, was that the F or the, the sorry, the E, um, going back up here, just real quick. Um, so when when F is a DNN, then this is called deep metric learning, right? So this is learning this E F of X. And um, but it's, it, it, so it's interesting to see, obviously, you know, we expect big things out of these deep networks. <clears throat> so let E be this F of X uh, theta, um, which is an element of RL, be the input, be an embedding of the input that preserves the relevant semantic or distance uh, aspects of the input. And it be an L2 normalized version, right? So this ensures that all points lie in hypersphere. And and then you know we can measure the distance with the normalized Euclidean distance, um, or, or there you know certainly there's some discussion of cosine similarity. So this is the um, uh, this is the deep metric learning approach, and um, Yeah, these uh, yeah, yeah, I, I mean, sorry, it, it is, it, I mean, for sure, right? So these, these um, all of these embeddings are necessary uh, um, or these latent space um, uh, versions are necessary because of the, it's, it's inability to scale. 
but I think it's it, it's really interesting at the end. I mean, it's it's funny that we have this discussion, and then it's and then it, it, he has this paragraph um, where it goes into you know the the, the references here um, talk a lot about um, mistakes that are being made um, with these techniques in terms of their um, uh, performance evaluations. And um, so one of these papers, uh, will it let me, and, uh, yeah, so the um, a, metric learning, a metric learning reality check is the, uh, the MBL 20 and, um, right, revisiting training strategies and generalization performance. Oh. Um, are, are they're, they're great papers to read and they're great papers that get at um, some, some, you know, foundational problems <laughs> with machine learning. It's not just like these particular techniques, but there's, um, you know, some good discussions of, uh, or some great quotes from like the 1970s saying like, um, with AI researchers saying to each other, like, if we don't, um, if we don't correct ourselves, you know, like reality will, or so, somebody else will. Um, and that, that it's just really important to actually see if these are, um, producing good results. So then he says, like, I'm going to switch and, and actually look at, um, simpler, and what does he say? Slightly older and simpler methods that tend to be more robust. So it, he also talks about, um, or this this is where the um, they try and bring in two other. I mean, they don't talk about it here, but the classification losses and then embedding losses are are um, some ways to Im improve these um, techniques. Uh, this approach is simple and scalable. Um, and the, um, these contrastive loss, well, I guess going to the contrastive loss where now um, in 16.5, you see um, networks that are trying to, uh, again, improve um, the pull and push. Um, losses or you know minimizing the distance uh, of similar Im images and maximizing the distance of dissimilar images okay and in 16.2.4.1 um, we have the uh, apparently the, the earliest approach where this the loss function in 16.10 you see with uh, um, uh, it's got that that first section here, when uh, where they're similar, where you know y i equals uh, y j, and where they're not, okay, and um, and then this is this is a hinge loss uh, um, at, with m is uh, greater than zero as the margin parameter. Um, so, and like they said, again, intuitively, we want to force positive pairs to be close and negative pairs to be further apart. <clears throat> um, the, the problem here was that these two sections, the pull and the push, are done separately. And um, because the magnitudes are not comparable, they... Uh, a solution was was proposed of triplet loss, um, where for each example I, known as an anchor, um, they are finding a similar positive example and a dissimilar negative example. So we minimize the following loss averaged over all triples. And now you can see that this is, um, because it's done together, uh, the, um, those distances, yeah, uh, they can compute that loss and, um, and those magnitudes are comparable. So, um, that is, 
see if it's I can make that a little bigger. Or, sorry, that won't help you. <laughs> Don't know if that will help on the on the screen. Um, just for my sake, if I can make that bigger. Um, yeah. Okay. Anyway, that that's that's the the benefit of the triplet, and then this this just keeps going, um, uh, in the sense that like now, if you imagine that now n pair loss, and um, so that you're giving, um, you know, you you're giving n minus one negatives and one positive for every anchor, and um, so this this large equation here in sixteen point twelve, you're, you're capturing uh, um, the cross entropy, um, and this uh, of of all the uh, of all these these particular um, examples, and um, this is also called uh, info um, noise. Uh, was it noise contrast estimate or um, noise contrastive estimate used in the CPC paper, um, which is, yeah, representation learning with contrastive predictive coding or this, this normalized temperature scale version of it. <clears throat> and um, So again, um, this isn't exactly uh, uh, making things any more efficient, though, right? So you're definitely um, you're definitely improving your your learning, but um, in sixteen point two five, speeding up these, yeah. So the main disadvantage of of ranking loss is this this you know. Uh, really, this big O N three cost of computing, right? So, like I said in the beginning, um, the the real um, the real sophistication that you see in this chapter, going from you know what, what essentially is kind of like uh, three three basic pretty basic concepts, right? Is that the, the the kind of advanced parts of these is really getting into how can we not consider all the data, right? Or how can we not compute all the all the pairwise interactions? Um, and so that um, yeah, so that we can improve this and try and get something that's closer to um, you know big O n um, or you know something something at least close to that. So two, two, I think two things that are proposed. One's this, this mining technique um, where we don't need to consider all the negative examples. And um, uh, so we can focus on you know, the, the important ones. Um, and I, I, think, or I think this is related to something called important sample <clears throat> um, that he doesn't mention here. Um, but but you can see what what they're trying to do is that um, you know it, it, I think you also might call these as like examples that have a lot of um, leverage in a in a, say in a regression or something like that. But um, anyway, the, the, if the uh, if we focus on negative examples which are closer to the anchor, then it's nearest positive example, then these are called hard negatives. And then if they, um, I think it was then they add another M, right, yeah. So um, if A is an anchor and P is its nearest positive example, we say that N is hard. For A, if DXA, XN is less than DXA, XP, right, okay. And then we just add to that that um, we will consider uh, um, semi-hard negatives that just like our, you know, yes, they are past this, they are greater than um, DXAXB, but um, 
but they are less than dx a x p plus m, where m is again this this um, positive uh, margin parameter. And um, so apparently this is used in Google's FaceNet. Oh, uh, um, uh, so so sorry. Just seeing seeing a question. Um, the uh, I thought that it reduced to the logistic loss in. Um, so, so, so to Lucy's question, what is the benefit of using cross entropy loss function over the logistic loss function? Um, I, I thought that the uh, cross entropy was just the um, it, it, you know was like the higher number example, and that it you reduce to the logistic if you um, go back to just a um, contrastive but if anybody sorry i don't have my sounds today um but uh I, i'd love to hear anybody else's thoughts on that um uh sorry so um yeah it, it, and i i just wanted to mention one other thing that uh, that comes up a lot but that um, and I'm and I'm um, sorry I missed the the previous the previous couple of weeks in, in terms of you know I'm sure that the mini batch um, discussions were were in the last section um, but these are going to come up a lot obviously because you know it, it, a lot of what canons are looking for is is some way to to mini batch or you know to not use all the data. Right. So um, anyway, that that's going to come up. You'll see that it discussed um, in some other examples. Uh, oh, OK, is that what the N? Uh, OK, so thank you, Pierre. So I think um, uh, that the cross entropy, yeah, OK. So the cross entropy is multi category as opposed to N equals two. Um, just okay thank you um i i see i see um okay and <clears throat> so um right so triple loss minimization is expensive even with the hard negative mining uh, ideally, we can find a method that is right. So this is the right. So again, you're kind of hoping that you can find some way to 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 reduce the complexity, and um, uh, so there's this a couple of proposals here uh, about other other techniques. I'm I'm going to keep going because uh, I, I probably can't do them real justice without getting into those those particular papers. Yes, it, it, so that it, it is the the entropy loss function is for multi-class classification. Um, or that, that's that's uh, that's what I was missing here. Or right. Um, well, uh, sorry, I, I, because I can't. Be very interactive. I'll, I'll just keep going. Um, uh, yeah. So I, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I, I couldn't really do the, the proxies much um, uh, justice. Um, optimizing the upper bound <clears throat> was was another uh, thought here. Is this it? Yeah. So in terms of um, again, I think. They're hoping to find just uh, uh, ways where you don't need to to do as much calculating, and that this provides you, you know, with at least you know a big O and C time here, um, and 
the, the only thing that I I understood, or you know, the only thing that I took away from this was that that um, this particular approach <clears throat> gets at I think something that is going to come up a lot with these these um, looking for the that comes up a lot looking for these low dimensional spaces, which is um, how do you how do you know you've got the right space, right? And so some of these are making assumptions that you're you're getting it right. <clears throat> um, uh, okay. And um, so, so I'm sorry, I, I'm gonna just keep going here. The, it, the one thing, the only, the only other thing that seemed really um, practical or that I, I could get was that, um, again, this, um, this particular uh, revisiting training strategies and generalization performance paper showing that increasing the um, uh, the intra um, intra class dis um, sorry increasing the reducing the intra class uh, uh, distances and increasing the inter or this ratio results in improved downstream performance. <clears throat> um, so uh, again, this suggests that we should not only keep uh, the centroids far apart, but we should also prevent examples from getting too close to their centroids. <clears throat> um, and uh, well, unfortunately, I don't have the best um, figure to support that, but <clears throat> that uh, that seems important. So there, um, again, uh, these, these papers were great. Um, uh, th these, these were pretty, pretty helpful. Um, again, they're going to drop into some important issues about how many batches are created. Um, and again, that, that does, you know, obviously that's, that's super relevant. Um, and, uh, yeah. So then the, the last thing, <clears throat> the last thing, um, was this spherical embedding constraint that, um, at least was also trying to, just improve somewhat the the learning learning rate, um, but is um, was like averaging was like normalizing the norm uh, uh, across uh, across the data. Um, yeah, encourages all the examples to have the same norm. And um, okay, so the the um, Sorry, I'm a little bit behind. Um, so the last last section, and again, you know, kind of like three three pretty simple ideas in this chapter. Um, the third is the kernel density estimation. <clears throat> so um, this is a form of general model, generative model, since it defines a probability distribution. Uh, uh, PX, and um, you know you can sample from that. Um, so it was definitely really um, helpful for, for me. I, I do have uh, trouble following all the different um, definitions of kernel, um, but uh, do check out this cursed kernels blog post if if you're like me and. Um, could use more discussion of that. Um, uh, so anyway, this is, um, uh, in this, we're gonna use a specific kind of kernel known as the density kernel. And it's a function K from R to R plus such that the integral KX DX equals one and that's it's symmetric. Um, uh, okay, and then this latter property implies that um, right the, the integral of x kx dx equals zero. 
Um, so in figure, what is it, uh, 61? Yeah. So here you have um, some of the, the uh, typical density kernels. <clears throat> The Gaussian um, is uh, obviously one that um, we all know and love. Um, it points out that that is not compact. And um, I think it was mentioned in 60.1 about some issues with that and how you might want to use some different kernels um, <clears throat> for, for uh, more efficient computing. Uh, right, so compact uh, means the function is non-zero over a finite range. Smooth means the function is differentiable over the range of its support. And boundaries means the function is also differentiable at the boundaries of its support. <clears throat> um, uh, and yeah, I think... Uh, so that I think maybe the 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 really key bit here is in sixteen point two eight is that we control the width of the kernel by introducing a bandwidth parameter h, right? <clears> the <throat> radial basis function is just making that a vector valued input, um, um, but the bandwidth parameter obviously will be an additional. Um, something to, to worry about. And uh, I think, again, back in 16.1 figures, um, let me just check that. I think there was some, maybe some better pictures of, no. Um, OK. Anyway, so the, um, uh, Forget the other. There's another general, another person, not just Parson, but um, who did this. But the window density estimator is the, the first example that they're going to go through. <clears throat> uh, and you know, of course, it does require specifying the number of clusters. And um, uh, which is oh yeah yeah. So so here's here's um, the, the the density. Uh, or the bandwidth. So in figure 16.9 uh, is the, uh, the example where in the top row, you're using the boxcar and the bottom row, you're using the Gaussian. And you've got these, uh, these six uh, data points and you can see the, um, uh, so the left is the bandwidth parameter is h equals one, and on the right it's it's two. So is your you're getting um, you know more um, overfit or overfitting or underfitting uh, or you know um, smooth, more smoothing with the with the right column, um, and. Right, so that's the, the KH. Um, I don't know why. Uh, right, so I think that's just saying that K depends depends on H. Okay, yeah. and um, right. So how to choose the how to choose that bandwidth parameter? Um, you can see from 16.9 that the, the bandwidth parameter has, has an effect, obviously. Um, and yeah, so in the one key, in the 1D data case where the true data generating distribution is assumed to be a Gaussian, <clears throat> one can show that the optimal bandwidth uh, is given by H equals sigma, what's this? Uh, for three uh, over three n to the one fifth, and we can compute a robust approximation to the standard deviation by first computing the median absolute deviation, <clears throat> and then using uh, the sigma estimate of one point four one point four eight two six man. 
Um, and, uh, you know, forgive me if, or if I didn't, uh, let me see. Okay. So I, I, I'm assuming he's saying this, this came from a, from a textbook, but, uh, uh, and, and then just um, finishing up these, the last couple of things here. So in 16.1, we discussed the, the nearest neighbor classifier. We can, uh, we can actually derive the classifier as a generative classifier uh, from the, the kernel density estimation. So rather than using a fixed bandwidth and counting how many data points fall within the hypercube centered on a data point, we allow the bandwidth or volume to be different for each data point. And then we grow a volume around X until we encounter those K data points regardless of their class label. So this is called a balloon kernel density estimator. And uh, if, the, if we let the resulting volume have size Vx, uh, this was previously hd, and let there be in cx examples from class c in this volume, then we can estimate the class conditional density as, as you see there in 16.34. Uh, where again, NC is the total number of examples in class C in the whole data set. <clears throat> so, um, okay, so they're giving you how to, how to, 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 if we take the class priors and then the posterior is given by this. Um, um, in, Oh, in, in terms of the generative model, um, uh, um, they, I don't think they, they don't mention it specifically as, they, they don't say that's the motivation, um, but that could be. Um, it, um, it, uh, uh, it just seemed like they wanted to uh, show how you could kind of see both, you know, in, in a lot of these examples where, you know, um, techniques can be both, you know, um, like classifiers at, as well as generative models. Um, but, um, but if somebody, I could, um, if you don't mind putting in the chat, if somebody knows that this is actually a, uh, a way of addressing scalability in particular, um, uh, that, would, that would be interesting. Or, you know, I, I assume this is, um, they talk about um, certainly using this to like do um, data augmentation. Um, maybe that was, again, I, I, I did try and follow up on some of the, the key papers. Um, I'll just I'll just keep you on here, um, and then yeah. So the next chapter is going to be kernel um, kernel methods, and um, so it seems like we're getting um, uh, a little bit uh, into the next chapter here. But um, KDE can also be used. Uh, uh, for regression. <clears throat> so if uh, in this in particular case, not a, not a Raya Watson estimator for the mean, um, they're um, deriving this from multivariate normal um, uh, to you know, be able to uh, do regression. Um, and they're using the um, the generative model to, to better, more accurately approximate the joint density uh, P, X, Y, uh, given D as follows in 16.37. And uh, right, in, yeah, so now it's got two K H's. Um, uh, and then, so wait, sorry. And um, 
you've got this large expectation. Um, so, I mean, it's good to know that you can do this. Again, I'm not quite sure the, the motivation for switching to these, um, um, but I know that they will be, they will be more efficient. Um, and they, you can also uh, produce an estimate for the, um, I think it's the intra class. No, no, is it the inter class variance? Um, and uh, and sorry, I'm, I'm petering out on the end here. This is uh, uh, where I didn't quite understand the the motivations for all these things, but I can see the the benefit certainly of um, low or you know locally weighted scatter scatter plot smoothing. Um, uh, you know, I've had to do enough, at least data analysis, um, where I can see the, the benefits of doing locally linear, linear regression. Um, uh, so forgive me for, for not ending um, too well on the, the estimator for the variance or the, the mean in this um, kernel regression, but um, I'm also hoping to see more of that in the next section. Um, uh, and yeah, so um, again, there's uh, uh, three big um, uh, three big topics from the I can, um, you know the three main points of this uh, particular section uh, or particular chapter was the um, the KNN classification or near, nearest neighbors and 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 then really why we're focused on this is that these are super important not just in you know regular space but um, for manifold learning which uh, you know is is um, so important these days and um, and I think spectral cluster so uh, a, a lot of the, the the issues that come up are going to be are going to be seen in those those particular techniques and that's that's why this is is so key to to get into um, the deep metric learning um, has some uh, you know, I think it'd be interesting um, to look at uh, what people are, are doing. Or again, I, sorry, I didn't cover this with the the autoencoders that um, that must have covered just in the last couple of weeks. But um, the deep metric learning seems uh, to to be very related, um, uh, and I pulled some more papers on that. And then kernel density estimation, so um, uh, turning turning it around into a generative model, and um, uh, trying to get at um, what is the underlying distribution. And I think that's that's that particular chapter. Um, thank you so much. And yeah, if if <laughs> I'm really sorry, I don't have sound today. Um, but um, uh, yeah, I, I do appreciate uh, everybody's time, and um, uh, I know I'm not exactly uh, a, a professor on this topic, but I, I do appreciate um, being able to do this this book with everybody. And um, yeah, thanks so much. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. I, 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 there's just some, you know, I got into some advanced topics and I, I kind of wondered, did this chapter feel to anybody like, <laughs> like he, he put in some bits, but he hadn't kind of finished it? Like, <laughs> like, I, I, I don't know if anybody else like, uh, felt that, but, um, uh, you know, th this this more more so than some of the other sections was, was like, hey, there's some you know there's some great papers uh, uh, 
yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's there's definitely um, more so than than some of the other chapters I've read. Like this had like some of those references that he he um, he has are actually really great to follow up. Yeah. Um, the MBL twenty in particular and the the rote plus twenty. Um, yeah. Anyway. Très bien. Merci. Um, just one, one second. Uh, oh, okay. We're... Uh, and yeah. Happy President's Day, everyone. <laughs> it's a, it's a holiday here, so uh, I actually have off, and I'm gonna heading out with the kids. Oh, I'm in the I'm in San Francisco, uh, 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 the United <laughs> States. Uh, it's President's Day, uh, and um, yeah, it, I think it's. Uh, I didn't grow up in the states, but um, I think this is a day to barbecue or uh, or maybe go shopping. Typically, it's a shopping day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sure, sure, uh, sure. Yeah, I, I I can't. I I, okay. I didn't realize it was also going to fall. Uh, it's a it was a long weekend here, so um, I've yeah. Anyway, but I I will uh, in the UK in, in London and Edinburgh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I I can definitely um, put together you know some of the the key stuff and. Um, I, I like this chapter in the sense that like it's it's got some yeah I did yeah <laughs> uh, the the British um, I I was I was bullied uh, as a kid and I think I leaned into it in the sense that like I I was an American growing up in the UK who still sounded American. <laughs> yeah, I but I, I I'll yeah. Give me, give me another, uh, give me, a, a, we're also supposed to be heading on vacation. So <laughs> finishing up a lot of things and then we're, yeah. we're heading out uh, to Bear Valley. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sure, sure. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, thank you everybody for joining um, and uh, we'll meet again here uh, next week. Have a, have a good day or a good evening, depending on what time zone you're in. And uh, we'll uh, see you next week. So bye-bye everybody. I'm trying to figure out why my Fedora system is. Uh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Take care. Okay. okay, thanks again everybody, bye.